We are here to discuss energy policy, the uh, new Congress, the new administration. So, uh, let's get started. Senator Murkowski, um, I guess the uh, the big news now is uh, you know uh, we've seen President Trump announce a few nominations recently in the last few weeks. Uh, you guys on Thursday are going to be having a hearing with the uh, uh, Deputy Interior Secretary nominee, I believe. How how have you seen the pace coming along? You've had some some complaints about the purchase is slow. It's been. It's been almost a little bit painful because we have, we've been given kind of an early heads up about some of, of the names that will be coming forward, and we're told that they're moving along, and yet getting the papers up to the committee has been slow. So as you mentioned, we've got David Bernhardt on, um, on Thursday. Uh, we've just gotten the paperwork in for uh, DOE Undersecretary Dan Brule up in a week or so and uh, we're still waiting on those FERC gnomes. Um, we've all heard the names, we've heard that they're imminent and uh, I'm not quite sure what imminent really means anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I mean we've heard we've heard President Trump say oh maybe I just won't fill some of these open positions and you know Steve Bannon talks about deconstructing the administrative state. Are you are you confident that you know all of the positions at Interior and DOE either in your jurisdiction will, will be filled? And how quickly do you think that'll well, happen? Well, when you say all, you know, I'm not quite sure how we're defining all, but is it critical that we get some of these key slots filled and filled quickly? Absolutely. The, the, the president has an agenda, the secretaries uh, need to be able to move forward and implement, and you really can't do that until you have your team in, in place. And if you think that that uh, perhaps these are all just empty desks. You know, some of them are, but some of them are, are, are continuing to be filled by individuals that have been there through previous nomination, uh, uh, previous administration. And so think about the, the internal operation uh, of that. So uh, I, I, I think that if the president is, is wise, if the teams that are doing this vetting are, are, are smart about it, the sooner they get their people in place to do the things that they would like to do, the better off they're going to be. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't help to, to, to delay, delay, delay. We've also seen, uh, you know, proposed, you know, pretty steep budget cuts out of the administration. Obviously, you know, 31% of EPA is, is the big number, but, I mean, at DOE, eliminating the loan guarantee program, eliminating RPE, slashing the fossil nuclear renewable efficiency budgets. Is that, is that a good idea? I mean, are those types of steep cuts? Well, that first you can of all, I think it, it remains to be seen uh, what the details of the actual budget will be. We're told that it'll be next uh, the week, uh, so next week, week next. So um, we'll see if it really is a 31% uh, decrease. If if programs like the loan guarantee are are impacted, uh, I think there has been a pretty strong signal coming out of the skinny budget that was laid down earlier. But uh, not only uh, myself, but others have been in conversation with. Uh, the Secretary of, of Energy, the Secretary of Interior, EP, uh, uh, the Administrator at EPA, and weighing in pretty heavily and saying, hey, uh, some of these, these programs are important, and if you perhaps don't understand why they're important, let me share with you why they are. Mm -hmm. So I know that that work has been going on, so we'll see. What, what actually comes down next week. Do you have a ballpark in mind for what an acceptable cut to EPA's budget might be? You're, you're going to be in charge you know, of uh, keep, writing that spending keep bill. Keep in mind that EPA has already seen significant um, reduction to their budget. And uh, you know, in the 2017 that we just, just passed, um, uh, there, were, there were further decreases there. So you know, when, you, when you think about the proposed 31 percent on top of what you've already seen that's that's a pretty aggressive cut so uh we'll take a look at at what the administration um feels is is within their sites and we'll go from there mm -hmm. uh, jay i want to i want to move on to you your your organization obviously is you know promoting clean energy and trying to give a, a sort of conservative message to why clean energy is important do you You've had conversations with, with the White House. You were, you know, I'm sure talking to the transition back since the election. Do you think that 
the administration is is doing what needs to be done to promote these you know these sort of low carbon or carbon free sources of energy that are available I think it depends what your goals are and um, you know I, we have a strong bias at clear path about leading uh, I think our primary competitor is China uh, I think if you look at right what they're spending on research right now especially in applied research they've now passed us in applied research uh, so if we don't it, it depends I mean if we want to be uh, a follower I mean if we if, if we want to preserve the sort of infrastructure that we have and bet on today's technology then I think we can make pretty big cuts um, I, I think what I would do is have the directors come back to me with how they want to cut um, but that's not where we are we are on on leading and we think that we could, if we focused on big goals and big outcomes, and then gave the people that are closest to these resources the goals to make their own plans, we think that bottoms up approach could give us a pretty good shot at doing it. It just kind of breaks my heart that we have these entrepreneurs. I was in a forum yesterday, and uh, uh, this, you know, this couple from uh, uh, Oklo, which is a um, sort of modular uh, fast reactor in a container might work for Alaska uh, to see them fight and struggle through our system when this technology could be hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue if it were applied properly that's the kind of thing if I were the administration I would really want to get behind because that's what drives jobs and that's what drives the American economy in my mind mm -hmm. and, and Mira your your customers are scattered all over all over Alaska they you know you serve uh, rural customers who you know may not have access to the grid you know Alaska is also experiencing the effects of climate change faster than you know most other uh, places on the planet how you know how are the people that you're serving grappling with those sort of dual you know reality the need for cheap reliable power and the, the experiences that they're sort of you know seeing outside their front door um, well of course in rural Alaska you have these small pockets of people that are scattered all over so we serve 58 communities and uh, our sum total of the number of customers we serve is about 11,000 so even in a very small community down here that is a small community it's you know a large city block down here uh, so they are very conservative in how much energy they use but uh, between the combination of electricity and heating fuel, it is their single largest budgetary item. But the problem is that there is no viable technology yet that can make a significant difference. Mm -hmm. uh, we do operate 11 wind farms, so we actually serve 15 of our communities with wind energy, We're building two more this year, um, and we've achieved displacement of about 40% of the electricity that we ge otherwise generate with diesel. So we're seeing some really high uh, penetrations, mm. but it's still not the answer because you can never provide 100% of the electricity with that. So you have to have diesel. And the sad corollary to that is that diesel is actually running less efficiently when you're operating wind because it has to run at low levels of the generator capacity in order to be available when the wind dies down or stops for any reason. So what's the technology that would fix that? Is it, is it storage? Is it SMRs? Is it microgrids? Is it some combination of all of those? Well, we are operating microgrids. That's exactly what we are operating. Um, actually, um, Jay mentioned uh, Oaklo. Uh, I actually was in a conversation with them just last week about uh, the potential for a one to two megawatt micro nuclear project. I would love to be a test bed uh, for something like that because I have always believed that the long-term solution really is these very small self-contained nuclear generating stations that are absolutely clean. They, clean. they run without fuel. You don't really have to even touch them for 10, 15, 20 years. What a boom that would be mm -hmm. if it were to actually work. But you know, going through the NRC is just a real challenge. Uh, we actually have a, a nuclear project that was proposed about 15 years ago to serve a community. Um, it was the Toshiba 4S project. And uh, they started going through the, re the regulatory process and never were able to get far enough to actually get a permit. So that has to change. Um, the administration has to be more receptive to real solutions. And how do you how do you make that happen, Sarah Murkowski? You you know what can Congress do? You had an energy bill that got you know basically to the one yard line mm -hmm. before it it didn't didn't get all the way there back in uh, in December. So how how has that experience sort of informed the the potential or I guess limitations of of you know policy making around this? Well, you never give up when the 
the issues are good, the issues are right and important. And I think with our energy bill, that's exactly the space that we're in now. Senator Cantwell and I uh, just yesterday met to, to discuss how we are kind of moving forward with our refreshed energy bill. Um, and that bill will include some provisions that we worked on last year in the same space, space that Mira has been talking about in terms of how you can advance um, uh, whether the permitting and licensing or just the R&D when it comes to, to the advanced nuclear. Making sure that uh, Making sure that our energy policies, though, are keeping up with what is going on in the energy space has got to be a priority. We haven't, we haven't, um, we haven't really done anything significant with energy uh, legislation in, in 10 years now. And why, why do you think that is? Yeah, maybe it's bandwidth in the Congress. Uh, maybe it's just priorities. There have been other issues that have assumed a higher level of priority. Um, and uh, you know, I, I suppose we could speculate all day long as to why we haven't seen more of it. Uh, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time thinking about why it hasn't happened. I'm going to focus my energies on making it happen. And that's, uh, that's the big push now. Quite honestly, the majority leader is looking for uh, initiatives that enjoy bipartisan support that we can um, bring to the floor. And if you look to what we were able to advance last year, there's not too many things that have made it through the Senate floor by a vote of 85 to 12. Mm -hmm. So we want to be able to reestablish that and, and, and really start pushing on it, on it once again. So that's going to be the, uh, that's going to be the, the the initiative in these next uh, couple months here. And how do you see that process linking up with, you know, uh, President Trump has talked a lot about uh, his desire for some sort of infrastructure package that may or may not be coming in the next few days or so. Um, you know, there's a lot of tension around regulatory reform. There's a big markup today happening in the uh, Oversight Committee. I mean, are those three efforts going to be sort of combined into one maybe super package? Are they going to remain separate? Is there a benefit you know, to doing it one way or it, the other? It, 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 it could be combined into a super package, uh, although I think if you look to, to other matters that have become so big, they become too big. And so I don't want us to be in a situation where the weight of something just brings it down. Now, it may be it's just the right uh, melding of different initiatives, I think we're all speculating as to what the infrastructure um, uh, package could actually look like. Mm -hmm. at, at the rate that it's going in my office, it is it covers everything from uh, roads and bridges to the toilet in your house. You know, it's it's really quite overwhelming. I, I hear Rand Paul is not a big fan of those, uh, <laughs> those toilet efficiency. Just saying. Just saying. <laughs> um, Jay, how do you, you know, I mean, one of the big problems last year, it seems like, with the energy bill was there, there was a sense, especially among House Republicans, that there was no big sort of win in, in the package. There was, you know, some LNG exports language that didn't, you know, fundamentally sort of change the process. And then it was a lot of stuff that was, you know, good ideas, but not necessarily, oh, we're getting rid of the Clean Power Plan, or oh, we're opening ANWR, or, you know, some sort of big marquee thing. So how do you make, uh, Jay, I want to ask you this, how do you make the argument to conservatives that, you know, some of the stuff that may be, you know, kind of boring or process focused or, you know, around the margins is still incredibly important to do? And, you know, how do you, how do you sell something that may not be the end-all, be-all as, you know, still a win and still sort of worth doing from a conservative perspective? I'd be dishonest if I told you I'd figured that out. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I thought I was a decent sales guy, but um, the, the, these are really hard. I mean, our party is so divided when you go from the right to the left and back to the middle again, and your arguments have to be different for, for each group. Um, she's, she's a black belt. I'm working on my green belt. Uh, <laughs> I probably need to go to lunch and pick your brain a little bit. <laughs> I don't know if there's anything left to pick. <laughs> Um, obviously, the, the overarching, you know, when you talk about energy policy, you can't really talk about it div divorced from climate change policy. And we've seen, you know, a big discussion about whether or not to stick with the Paris Agreement. We've also seen, you know, a lot of private companies are, you know, taking more seriously how to reduce their carbon footprint, how to 
uh, you know, how to be more efficient, how to be sustainable, is that, you know, is that effort going to create any sort of momentum that would spill over into the White House or into, you know, the more especially sort of conservative precincts of the Republican Party that have been really resistant to anything that is, that is labeled as a climate policy? I think it could. Uh, I think it could. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure in, in, in what way it will take shape. But as you know, things are happening on their own, not because of any policy directive, not because of any mandate out there, uh, but because in many cases it's just good business judgment to make these decisions to go in this direction. Uh, I, I, I do think we will see the administration developing its climate policy. I was in Fairbanks for the Arctic Council this past week at the, at the ministerial where uh, the United States passed the gavel to Finland after two years. Uh, there was a great deal of uh, debate as to whether or not climate would even be addressed in the declaration. And I think it is significant to note that not only uh, was it addressed, it was acknowledged in the Fairbanks Declaration that uh, climate change is happening, uh, that we're seeing the, the impacts uh, in the Arctic at, at twice the rate, uh, that it is attributable to uh, emissions. Um, while it didn't go on about the Paris Agreement, it actually mentioned the words, which I thought was really quite significant. So uh, it, it's probably the first time that I have seen uh, a document that was that was led by the United States with seven other Arctic nations um, in this administration acknowledge the uh, the the issue of, of climate change and the uh, responsibility to act collectively globally on this issue uh, and as Secretary Tillerson mentioned when he was there when asked about Paris, he said, what we're doing in the administration is working to define what our climate policy is. And then, then making a decision on Paris will, will basically come on its own. So I, I, I do think that you're going to see some, um, uh, some brighter lights uh, out of the administration in terms of where they see the focus on, on climate initiatives. Uh, that will help uh, guide some initiatives, but in the meantime, again, you have business and industry that is just working to, to be more responsible when it comes to their own emissions and, and looking to their bottom line and, and how these, uh, these particular um, initiatives benefit them. And what's your, I mean, when you, when you talk to either cabinet secretaries or you know, others within the White House, I mean, what's your advice when it comes to should we stay or should we go in terms of uh, the Paris deal? You know, I've, I've been somewhat agnostic in terms of whether you stay in or whether you stay out. I think what we need to do is look at that and say, okay, where, where can we be most useful? Uh, where, where do we have most leverage? Um, and of late, I've been coming down on the side of you have more leverage if you stay in. Mm. Uh, now, whether or not the administration uh, agrees with that uh, remains to be seen, but I think that's how we should view it. And uh, yeah, I I tell you, I'm I'm so Alaska centric. You all know that, but uh, I, I I look to to what is happening in in our state. Uh, I think about. Um, the visit that President Obama made in 2015, where he went specifically to, uh, to see some of the impacts of climate change, flew over Kivalina, a community that is, is uh, threatened by coastal erosion, and uh, a lot of, lot of press about it. Mm -hmm. And then he left, took the pictures, but there was a billion dollars that was to be directed for the Green uh, Global Fund, not a dime of that was going to be spent in, in a place like Alaska. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I guess I'm looking at this and saying, you know, we, we have some, uh, some responsibilities here at home as well. And, and, and how, 
how that piece of it can be uh, part of the discussions with, with Paris, I think is an important mm -hmm important uh, part of the discussion. Yeah. Mira, I want to I get your, your thoughts on this since you, you know, obviously Senator Murkowski spends plenty of time in Alaska as well, but, you know, I mean, do you think it matters to the, the customers that you're dealing with? Does it, does it make a difference whether we stay as part of the, the Paris Agreement or, you know, I mean, the extent to which official Washington policy is climate change exists and we should do something about it? I mean, how much does that matter to the people that you're serving? Well, you know, we are very distant from the whole concept of the Paris Agreement, but um, I can tell you that most of the villages that are facing the threat of, of erosion and the need for something drastic to happen in order for them to be able to stay in their ancestral lands, um, there is no doubt in my mind that climate change is, is a leading contributor to that and that emissions are a major part of that. We have to acknowledge that that is a major issue and we have to stay on board. I, it, you know, that's my personal opinion um, because I think it makes a difference. Now, for that to result in draconian standards that are forced upon us who are struggling to serve these small communities, that isn't the appropriate way to go about it. But to assist all of us that are trying to make a difference in making these, these communities self-sustaining, weaning them away from fossil fuels and so forth, that has to be a priority. Because mm -hmm. I think it makes a difference. Alaska gets a bad rap because uh, all of the uh, liquid fuels that are consumed in the state are attributed to the 710,000 population. And we look like we're the world's biggest consumers of energy, <coughs> but we're not. Mm -hmm. Because we have this massive amount of international air traffic that comes through Anchorage and Fairbanks because of all the freight that moves through there. All that usage gets attributed to Alaskans, and that's not right. Mm. Um, but we need to make a difference there as to how we are powering our, our energy. Mm -hmm. uh, Jay, what do, you, what do you think the, you know, I, I guess what's the n number one or two things that uh, the Trump administration or Congress could do in the next year or so to, to you know, try and sort of send that message that climate change, clean energy is important, and here's, here's the way that we are going about it in a conservative way that is not, you know, draconian, as, as Mira said. Well. We, we do kind of specialize in that, right? Uh, we, we think we have, we have talking points. Our website, clearpath.org, uh, and clearpathactionfund.org um, has a ton of information on it around these issues and how to talk about it and how it polls. I mean, I really do believe there's a win-win-win here, right? And it gets back to my first point where, do, you know, do we want to lead and follow? And everybody talks about jobs, et cetera. Um, but energy is the biggest market in the world, you know, by far. And uh, China has got their eyeball exactly focused on that. And if we decide that we, and, and, and the world's decarbonizing, and, and, and they've decided to, every utility company, uh, including the big public coal guy, the, the producers, the utilities, the, even the big coal companies, the Exxons, the Southerns, the Dukes, the Exelons, they all assume that carbon is going to be a constrained resource at some point in the future. Right? And, and most global energy executives, most global leaders believe that and are pricing that in. Now, we might believe that climate change is not risky. Most, I think it'd be hard to say there's no risk, right? But if we are if we're trained in finance, even something that is low risk would be hedged against. Or it's really risky. You know, I'm a little bit more on the, you know, I'm towards the right a little bit on that. But, but I think to some degree that's kind of beside the point in the, today's environment where we're trying to create economic opportunity. We're not going to win on labor. We're not going to win on unskilled labor in this country. I just, I don't think that that's realistic, right? Where we have got to win is on innovation and skilled labor and software and advanced manufacturing. And again, this is the biggest market in the world. So if we're playing for this quarter and the next quarter and the next, you know, the next poll or the next election, I'm, I would short the heck out of this country economically. Right? And I don't know what's going to change about this. But China doesn't think that way. And they've got a high temperature gas cooled reactor coming up on board this year. I was talking to John Hopkins in the crowd here from 
News Gale and Chairman of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. Nuclear is going to be a half a trillion to a trillion dollar market per year based on what the pipeline looks like from primarily Asia, right? We own all the ideas. They've taken those ideas. They're building those ideas. And the jobs that are created, the jobs at Vogel that you're reading about in the paper, I mean, the welders there are making 70 bucks an hour kind of stuff. And so, yeah, we can go build a bridge and we can go fix a toilet. But then five years from now, what happens? Are we going to be doing that ag again? And where does that job go? Right? So the industrial might that we had in the 60s is what really leapfrogged this country ahead at the 50s and 60s. When we were an industrial nation, we were playing longer term ball, I think, and we were winning. Right? So to me, it's all about industrial, clean, affordable energy, energy that's going to play into the biggest market in the world. How many cars are going to be electrified in 20 years? A lot. Okay. I, we own stock in, in VW. It's beaten down. It's a good buy, by the way, I think. <laughs> <laughs> they want to do a million electric cars by 2020. Right? All the bigs are watching Tesla and going, this is where the ball's going. Right? What does that mean? That means lower transportation fuels and higher energy fuels. Right? Again, a carbon-constrained world, massive economic opportunity, huge job creator. But we've got, we got to get our education systems in order. We've got to get engineers out there. And we can do this. And, and the best ideas are here today. Mm -hmm. But we've got our thumb on these people. And so to me, that's the win-win-win. And yes, you stay in Paris, because guess who's going to lead when we don't? China. Mm -hmm. Clearly. So, so I, I'm, I'm pretty, if you can't tell, I'm kind of passionate about this. So how but do I do you, think there's a win-win-win. Sure. So how do you then take that approach? And if you look at you know, what the IEA or the EIA says in terms of you know, trajectories of, of you know, energy demand, prices, emissions, et cetera, I mean, it's all you know, emissions are, are flat or slightly you know, more or less flat out of, in the sort of projection of current policy expectations, whereas you know, if you look at an IPCC 450 scenario, the line's going, you know, pretty sharply down over the next 30 or 40 years. How do you, how do you bridge that sort of gap, or do you, do you need to sort of know how you bridge that gap in advance of pursuing, you know, any sort this of policy? Is, uh, I mean, complexity, I, I used to, uh, when I did a few speeches back in the day as a business guy, um, I, had, I had one speech that I would give over and over, and the, basically the headline is complexity kills. Right? If we're scattered out and focused on a thousand things, we're not going to be very good at our core things. Right? And this is a really complex thing. Um, so I do think we've got to get focused, and that's our push. We're not really on the regulatory side. In fact, we'd like to see, of course, better, more streamlined nuclear uh, and differentiated nuclear regulation streams for folks like uh, Mr. Hopkins there. Um, We'd like to see better hydro regulations. I think micro power for, for your uh, micro hydro, for example, a company called Natel, I'd be interested in. Uh, there's some fast moving rivers up in Alaska and they generate, I think you could drop in some units and generate power at cheaper, perhaps, I don't know. Um, so we would, but, but the regulation there kills a lot of this innovation. And there are lots of groups that are working on, it, on regulation and that side of things. But we, do, we believe that we have got to hit the innovation gas pedal, and we've got to hit it hard. For example, yesterday I heard of a new thing called Apollo, which is uh, 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 a few, uh, basically used fusion, fusion to release uh, neutrons into a fission reactor, uh, and, and has a promise, you know, could surprise everybody on the timing of, the, of that technology. We don't know what's going to happen, but if we kill the innovation engine, right, it was really only the DOE. None of the energy companies, maybe minus Southern, who's got a relatively small budget next to DOE, this is not going to happen in a garage in Silicon Valley, and it's not going to happen on software, right? This is industrial scale innovation. We have got to, it, we have got to get the technology right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to project these, uh, these lines, because we don't really, we can't really predict, predict that exactly. Mm -hmm. But we should be in front of that, and that's my point. Senator so, Marquez, I want to get your thoughts on this. You know, obviously, you're a big supporter of, of innovation and, mm -hmm. and the work that DOE does in that in that area. If there's if there's more that the government can do to you know encourage innovation, as as Jay's calling for, what can be done to to ensure that that innovation is 
not going to make you know the problem worse whether that frankly whether that problem is climate change or prices or reliability or anything else i mean how do you how do you set the rules of the game in such a way that that you know the, these trends at least move in the in the right direction well, i think the first thing you do is you do not cut the uh, cut the knees out from under rpe uh, you make sure that our national labs um, are, are appropriately and sufficiently resourced, but also that our national labs then are really working, partnering with industry rather than being somewhat uh, I isolated in terms of what it is that they are working to advance. I think there's a lot more partnering that can and should go on, uh, but I really do think that the regulatory piece is something that we have to pay attention to. We have to address uh, because it, 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 it seems that more often than not, you will have the good ideas getting out front and after, you know, after 10 years and, billion, and millions of dollars, people kind of give up mm -hmm. and you can understand. You know, we, we talk about the hydro space and, and the reality that uh, right now we're looking at about 10 years on average to re-license a hydro facility. Re-license. This is existing. And it's taking 10 years on average and, and millions of dollars. I was talking with, uh, with one of our um, uh, utility managers down in the south central part of, of the state, and he has a small hydro facility. Um, small hydro. He's been working on a license now for six years. He, it's cost him several million do millions of dollars. No fish in this dam at all. And, and, and we, we, can't, we can't get moving with this. So making sure that we've got the institutions in place, RPE to help with the innovation, our labs, uh, but also dealing with the regulatory morass that uh, is really holding back so much of the innovation. And we certainly hear that in, in the nuclear space. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could add to that, sure. yeah, you know, we, we want to build a small hydro project to serve one of our communities uh, of about 200 people, Old Harbor and Kodiak mm -hmm. Island, Lisa's been there. Um, we uh, spent seven years getting a license to build this. We, we asked for two 262 kilowatt turbines. Um, they licensed it for one because we didn't currently have the load to justify a second one. So we have to go through the entire licensing process again for another 262 kilowatts. It has cost us over a million dollars to get that license. Now again, divide that back amongst 200 people, less than 100 services. Uh, that, that's the sort of hurdles that we have to overcome. And, and so what it does is it pushes out that timeline, it pushes out that cost, so it, every year that is delayed, it costs another three or four or five percent to build it. So in the end, we're going to be looking at a $10 million, 262 kilowatt hydro facility. And it's all because of the regulatory hurdles that you have to go through. It's and, unconscionable. And until that is built, that community is powered exclusively diesel. by diesel. And so you, you've, got this, you've got this weird inconsistency here where policy is saying, well, you need to move towards renewables, but we're putting every possible hurdle in place uh, in, in front so that you cannot do that and you're stuck in, in the last century. Mm -hmm. it, it's incredible. It's incredible. Oh, great. Well, I think we're going to, we've got a few minutes left. Time for some questions, if anybody in the audience. Uh, yeah, I'd like, to, um, I'd like to take some audience participation. Chairman McCaskett's a little bit. Before we do, though, I just wanted to highlight Mira's um, experience and a little bit of drawing Alaska into this conversation a little bit more about being the test bed and how there's a real move in the lower 48 towards integrating more renewable energy. Well, that's a move towards more microgrids, even though in large communities and Alaska really is the front line of that where we have 200 plus rural communities that are isolated and are looking to find solutions that are affordable and it really is a test but I'm there if you can just real quick and then we'll take some questions absolutely um, as Robert said we have we, we serve 58 communities and they are scattered throughout Alaska uh, and the average size of communities about they use about 140 kilowatts so if you can 
translate that, I can tell you that there's a small, relatively small grocery store near my home in Anchorage. It uses twice as much electricity in a year as does one of my average villages. So that puts it into perspective. Um, we have now got, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, 11 wind farms, and, and we are looking at pretty high penetration in most of those wind farms. Our penetration level reaches above 100%, so we have to divert a lot of that electricity or scale down the turbines in order to keep them operating. We actually have just uh, successfully um, entered into a, a, a partnership with our Alaska Center for Energy and Power in, at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the Office of Naval Research to uh, put together an innovative <coughs> approach where essentially you're going to have storage for just 90 seconds, just the time that it takes to be able to bring a diesel genset up online to pick up that load drop. We actually are displacing, I mentioned, up to 40% in some of our villages. I think we can get closer to 60 or 70% if we had that ability to bridge that gap. We talk a lot about storage and flywheels and so forth. Doesn't work in most rural Alaska uh, contexts because we don't have uh, the ability to put that kind of, of investment into this very expensive uh, concept. However, there are alternative approaches to that, and that's where you know the government can come in to help us to find those solutions. Don't just be looking for the very large solutions. So let's look at the small solutions because from Alaska, it's but a short step to the rest of the Arctic, and from there to the rest of the world. Um, it's, I'm, I'm a board member of the National Rural Electric Co-op Association, and I'm on uh, our international committee and, and also on the technology committee. And what we are doing over there in, in that window is absolutely remarkable. And, it, and it's scalable eventually. It's scalable, you absolutely. Test it at a smaller scale, and then you can scale it up to larger communities in the lower 48, and it really is the, um, the test bed. Thank you so much. And can you just introduce yourself? Sure. Stand up and uh, good morning, Andrew Patterson with Environmental Business International. All three of you talked a little bit about nuclear, but we're at an impasse, Jay, when it comes to leadership. I mean, despite the chairman's erstwhile efforts on this, which we all salute, the commercial lenders aren't going to touch new nuclear. They're not going to lead. Equity is, makes it very difficult to fund nuclear just with equity. The, the federal government is going to have to come to the table not only with funding, but with ways, different ways of funding the NRC, because if you blow a billion dollars, a billion dollars, just getting the first units licensed, that's a prohibitive financial hurdle the private markets will not respond to. Maybe tomorrow we can get the first units built in Alaska, but to get leadership, Jay, we're gonna need a public-private investment partnership to forge a breakthrough. Other countries, as you've said, with China, have already taken the lead. How do we do it? <laughs> There's the question. Uh, well, <laughs> I, you know, all, all, is not, all is not lost. Uh, there is interest uh, at DOE, sincere interest at DOE, and there's sincere interest in the White House on a holistic nu uh, you know, nuclear approach, I think. Uh, it's complicated. There's a lot of things that we need to do. There's a lot of levers to pull. Um, the existing technology technology going forward is going to be challenged. I think we need to do everything we do can do to preserve and extend the life of the current fleet, and that has its own policy set. Uh, my personal bias is that we created advanced technologies that are cheaper to build, cheaper to operate, can be made in a, in a factory instead of on site with 6,000 workers pouring more concrete than you could probably see out the window here. Uh, and so I don't, I don't know, I don't know what the future of that looks like, but I do believe that there are real ideas. I keep talking about New Scale and Oklo and these things. New Scale is real. Uh, you know, it's got, uh, it's got a PPA agreement with the utility. It is an, it's, a, it's the same uh, chemistry and an advanced technology package that uh, you know we have high hopes for. We've got to support these companies. Show proof of concept. Uh, we've got to get the DOE, DOE focused on this, and we've got to get the regulatory environment. Uh, Clearpath.org will be updated with more specifics on this. We have stuff now, but uh, I agree. And, there, and, and there's a vacuum here in advocacy a bit. Uh, I think the environmental community has not, is, is probably on the margin anti, well, is anti-nuclear. Um, and th that's a problem as well. We're work you know, we'd like to see that move, and I think it is moving. There's a lot of work to do. Question from this side. Hi, 
Tata and from Third Way. Uh, one of my observations uh, uh, with the young generation, especially in nuclear, is that they are fascinated with the idea of being clean energy entrepreneurs. And I'm wondering how much of the context you talk about affects their motivation and to getting into this area. Because I think that a lot of things you talked about will fix and make the pathway for them um, much more positive and want them to, to be engaged. I will, I will just make the observation that I, I agree entirely with you that, uh, that nuclear is, with the, with the younger generation, you don't have some of the, of the history that, uh, that perhaps some of us that are a little bit older here might, might carry about, about nuclear and the fears. I think young people look at it and say, this, this is a clean energy source, what are we doing about it? Does it have to look the way that our, our parents viewed it? Um, but part of that is making sure that they know that there's actually a future for them. Because if they don't believe that nuclear is going to be part of a robust uh, energy portfolio in this country, then they're not going to uh, undergo the training, the schooling uh, to, to, to to be part of it if they don't believe that there's a future there. So we need to make sure that we are, are, are promoting as, as, as a significant part of our energy uh, portfolio and the, and the balance that comes with it, that, that energy, uh, that nuclear is, is a significant part of that. Get them excited about it. Another question. I, I know that I want to be uh, respectful of the chairman's time, um, but I think we have time for one more. Is there a question here? Hi, Katie Cullen with SC Partners, and thank you all very much. This has been a terrific discussion. To follow on to the chairwoman's discussion on jobs, I mean, we all know that the jobs being created in this energy market right now are wind and solar jobs, and a lot of them are being created probably the fastest growing sectors. But, and, and a lot of vets are getting in and a lots of young people are, are going into that clean energy business. Is there a way to actually help sort of this generation or maybe a little bit younger than my generation but who are still working in, in the coal industry because we know that the, those coal jobs aren't coming back, no matter what, frankly, the administration says. Is there a way to help retrain them in some of the energy jobs that are being created? And is there a public-private partnership that could be done between the industries? Thank you. I don't know anything about the public-private partnerships that may or may not be going on, but in, in terms of retraining and opportunities there, I think that those are, are, are clearly uh, possible and, and, and worthy of, of pursuit. In our energy bill, we do have you know, provisions um, related to, to workforce training, and workforce training also means retraining from wherever you have been to, uh, to, to wherever we might have you go with those next, uh, th that next evolution of, of energy jobs. So I do think that there are opportunities there. It's, it's not a, it, sorry. No, go ahead. It's not a large uh, absolute number. Uh, if you take cold jobs, call it 60 to 70,000, and then let's say half are East Coast and half are Powder River Basin or West. And uh, so I think given the small numbers, it's manageable. Um, and I think we're looking at pensions uh, being uh, guaranteed uh, through, uh, I know Trump's working on that, uh, the president, excuse me, the president's working on that. Um, but you also have to think about the coal workers that are working in the plants themselves, and it's still 30, 33% of our grid. Uh, and you have to think about the whole sort of coal ecosystem. And you also have to think about the fact that uh, coal drives most of the power in the <coughs> world, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, and for China to write off all their coal plants, when people think about a renewables future, that would be a $5 trillion write down. I don't think that's realistic. So again, back to the economic opportunity. Uh, carbon capture is real and works where, the, where, where you can pump it into the ground and enhance oil. It works, it can work economically. We can win there. We're not gonna win there if we cut the Office of Fuel Energy 
by uh, fossil fuel energy by uh, you know 70 percent. Not going to win. China has got those facilities up and testing now. They're going to win. Uh, we'll lose the jobs and we'll lose the export opportunities. One of the last question here. The chairman has to go. But Okay, Steve Nadell from the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy. Good morning, Senator. An observation and a question. You mentioned uh, uh, some of the challenges in uh, some of the rural communities, particularly the coastal communities, uh, dealing with uh, sea level, uh, melting permafrost, et cetera. Uh, the observation is, have you explored uh, opportunities to work with people from Florida, from Virginia Beach, from some of the uh, communities up and down the Mississippi that are more to flooding to together build a, a coalition. That's the observation. The question, uh, very specifically, in the skinny budget, the president proposed to eliminate the Energy Star program. And I was curious if you had any uh, opinions about that. Well, <coughs> not only Energy Star, but some other uh, some other initiatives that I viewed as as, as pretty key were on. Uh, on the, the docket for elimination, and let's just say I don't agree with those uh, being eliminated, and uh, we will have an opportunity to weigh in um, more particularly after this, this full budget is laid down. So whether it's Energy Star or Essential Air Service or uh, some of the other things that we looked at and gasped a little bit, uh, we'll have an opportunity again to weigh in. Your, your observation about uh, coalitions with others that are facing um, levels of, of erosion, whether it's from our rivers uh, or from in our, around our coastal communities. I think there are, there are many, many areas where we can be, be partnering to understand better how, how different communities are dealing with these issues, how uh, how we can move towards greater adaptation, mitigation, in recognizing that we are seeing, we are seeing these changes. I think in Alaska, it's just that much more pronounced, and and so perhaps there is greater awareness, and and it allows us an opportunity to lead with some of the, the uh, the suggestions and and some of the, uh, some of the things that we are doing right now. Uh, our, our, our great challenge, though, is relocating a community is really expensive. Mm -hmm. And so how, how, we can, uh, how we can address these, these issues that um, are having immediate impact to Americans um, today is, is, is part of the, the challenge and the responsibility in front of us. Chairman. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And, and the chairman has to run back to the hill because, as you know, we're all at full speed. Yeah. What's up for that? Yeah. But thank you so much. And um, thank you all, Joe Mira. Thank you for coming from Alaska. <laughs>